Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at first submission by Samantha of her horse, Royal Circus. Royal Circus is a horse off the track. If you look at this muscling, you can just see there's absolutely no top line on this horse whatsoever. But the amazing thing with this horse is that it ran 23 races, it's nine years old, and uh, is still sound, the chest on that horse. A really good example of a thoroughbred horse, and a good example of how sound a thoroughbred horse can be you know, if they must have been handled somewhat correctly. But some of the best horses I've ever had in my life have been thoroughbred mares off of the racetrack. One of my students won the preliminary championship here in three-day eventing in California on a 21-year-old mare that went on to have babies after that. And at 21, the horse had been on the track. It jumped uh, steeplechase. It had been an open jumper and then a three-day event horse at 21 and won the preliminary championships, as I said, here in California. And... Uh, you know, it's just amazing how tough these horses can be. So you can see this one has obviously, you know, <laughs> whose training has been, uh, I'm sure it ran on the track upside down, amazingly enough, 23 runs. Uh, but you can see how the back is dipping there in front of the uh, hip bone there. But how already you've already begun to change this horse. I mean, this walk is already really very good. This is going to be a great horse to watch develop. Um, because she'll, she'll end up being a very, very nice horse, and you'll see drastic changes. A year from now, this will not even look like the same horse. So as to the lunging in the round pen, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever, you know, especially if I very often do that with horses. Uh, you know, If I have a horse with a damaged mouth or something like that, um, if I have a round, a round pen available to me, the trouble with some round pens is they're a little on the small side. This one, however, looks like it's about the right size. 20 meter circle is about what you'd like it to be. So we can see how the horse traveling here, very hollow, stabbing the ground with its front legs, pulling itself. If you watch the hips, you can see how the, uh, the hocks, rather, how they're falling out. They're way behind the horse when the horse is still trotting. So that's what we have to solve, is the problem of getting this horse to stretch into the contact, or even stretch into no contact that is there. But what you will see, uh, most horses will, given time, stretch on their own and start to find their own, uh, their own stretch. Uh, as we see in people who have these hot walkers, you know, a lot of the jumper barns now have these, what they call European hot walkers, where instead of a rope pulling them along, they're in like a little box moving along. And it's very interesting because, you know, while I don't really uh, ever do that kind of training, or would I, um, but on the other hand, for those horses, it's very often the best training that they get. Uh, at least they get to walk and stretch out because the jumper riders, you know, generally don't, don't walk their horses much. They don't trot them much these days. Most of them just go right to the canter and start going. So, But you'll notice how in those hot walkers, if the speed is, ju is adjusted just right, in almost no time at all, any kind of horse you put in there will start stretching down or it will over a little bit of time. Now that's really good there, and it shows you once again how this horse is finding this all by itself. The trouble today is, you know, so many horses grow up today not on grass and not in pastures, and uh, we see this all the time. They come to be four years old, and they look more like two-year-olds to me, and that they're so high behind they haven't developed because they haven't eaten with their heads down and grazed for long periods of time. That's what that does. It pulls the shoulders up through the withers and it helps the, the maturing process of the horse. But that only happens if the horse is moving. That's why it's so important that horses uh, be raised on grass where they can put their heads down and really keep moving with every step. They're constantly moving and stretching that neck and pulling the withers up through the shoulders. So how important that is. But this one we can see that already she's coming around very nicely even without a halter and without a um, bridle on the horse. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing this in the round pen whatsoever, as long as you can keep control of the horse, and long as you do it correctly. You know, what I disagree with, you know, I see these people going in to this liberty work and going in a round pen with a horse and then trying to make hand signals at them to do this and that, and they've got a little stick in their hand that's about two and a half feet, three feet long with a lash on the end of it, so that's not nearly long enough to get to the horse like a normal lunge whip would. Remember, that's the whole point of correct lunging. It keeps us away from the horse. So we're not, you know, right next to the horse where it can strike us or run over us or bite us as the case may be. And those things do happen. So we want to be out of the strike zone and that's what the correct lunging does for you. It gets you outside the strike zone of the horse and, and you can then manipulate it from afar, so to speak. 
It's almost like when you see horses in pasture, once again, when you see them yield their hindquarters one to another as the alpha horse comes up, he doesn't even have to get that near before the one that, you know, is the non-alpha horse is going to move its hindquarters away. But this is starting to look good here. With each step that she stretches, it looks better and better. You can see how she just kind of stabs the ground as she goes along here. So she's still not really working over her back yet. It improves right there. Just for that one moment she went down. Watch very closely, folks, and see how that changes. Just even for that one stride, the hawk takes a rounder movement. These are the kind of things we have to train our eyes to be able to see. Is the horse really over its back or not? It's the most important thing you'll ever learn in training, as it's what allows you to evaluate you know, what you're doing here. And even sometimes it can be a when you run into a resistance, you know, you have to ask yourself right away, well, is the horse hollowing when I'm asking for this? And, uh, and if the answer is yes, you know the horse wasn't prepared to do it. So really lunging free, that was quite good. I have no problem with that, except I would like to have seen it move a little more forward. Um, but with a thoroughbred type horse, you know, we really don't want to get them <clears throat> running is one of the biggest things. So the fact the horse is going slow, I like the fact that you're having to push this horse a little bit. So, so that's a good thing. Many of them come back for the racetrack you know, kind of fried out of their minds. But if the, if a horse ran as many races as, as this horse did, you know, it, it probably was uh, a pretty well-manageable horse, so to speak, and to be able to stay sound and do that many races. So you can see how this walk starts to look a little better here. But you can still see how the underside of the neck is engaged. She hasn't quite gotten over her back yet, but it's improving, like with each step. Kind of imagine when you watch horses, because when we talk about thrust, that's what that, this is, that you watch them where the hind legs, when it pushes from the center of the body, how when that pushes correctly, it pushes the back up. That's why we do so much lateral work in the very beginning. Now, when I say a lot of lateral work, I mean in a walk. The beauty of the walk is we can do a lot of it in whatever we want to do, and it doesn't, it's very low impact on the horse. So we don't want to be like all the ladies who took these high-impact aerobic classes, you know, back in the 80s, if any of you are old enough to remember that. And, you know, every, one of the, every person I knew who was ever an instructor of that ended up having to have their knees and hips replaced and ended up cripples as older age. So, you know, while it might have felt fun and invigorating to those people why they were doing it, it was destroying them in the process. And that's what we have to be sure we're not doing with horses. You know, very often... Uh, you know, we can do walk, trot, and canter on any horse any day, but the question is, should we? Is it taking years off the horse's life in order to do it, just like the aerobic dancers, you know? So we want to be sure that our work isn't destroying the horse, and that's why it's so important to get this concept of doing one thing right at a time. That is, the horse must get over its back at the walk before you bother to try to trot it. Um, not to saying you're not doing sh short periods of trot, but as soon as the horse, you see that within a moment or two, the horse is not going to re relax into it. That is, you know, maybe in, at the outside five minutes, which would be a really long time, you know, more like one or two minutes. Then I'd come back to the walk. So you always just keep repeating back to what the horse can do correctly. If that's only the walk, you come back to the walk and get that correct again. And then the next time you come back and you try the trot again. And what you'll see, this is just how it works. So when the trot is good enough, you can try the canter. If the canter is good, you can do it. If it falls apart and it's hollow, you go back to only trot, walk and trot work. One day you'll ask for the canter and the horse will simply be able to canter. Legolas is a perfect example uh, with us. And you'll see some uh, videos on him very soon developing his canter work. We really did not even canter the horse for the first two years. He was just too big every time we tried him once in a while. But the canter was just so explosive and so uh, dynamic, and he just couldn't slow himself down, being the big, energetic young boy that he was. So uh, now his canter, once we begun to canter, it was no problem at all to get a collected canter because we waited and didn't end up laming the horse in the process of trying to teach it to canter. Remembering once again that the faster you go, the harder it is on the horse's legs. That's why we must stick to this principle of get one thing right first. Get the walk over the back, then you get the trot over the back, then you get the canter over the back. And in between, we simply don't worry about things like transitions. Once we get the horse over the back in the walk and we get it over the back in the trot, all of a sudden, all your transition problems will disappear. There is nothing worse for horses, and I see people doing this all the time, you know, thinking this is doing something, but by making a lot of transition, downwards transition after downwards transition, they end up with the horse crawling around the arena. 
Now that's starting to look really nice. And look how immediately the horse changes, how the back end just starts to swing automatically a little more through. And watch as her head comes up. You can almost see her like collapse in her middle and watch how far the hock goes. All of a sudden it goes into slow motion and the hock can't come forward anymore. So that's what we're trying to do all the time in all of this work is we're trying to show the horse the posture that it can best perform the work that we're asking for it in. All there is to it, just like a person going to the gym. You can go to the gym and and uh, do a lot of weights once again and get yourself all pumped up. But if you didn't do that weightlifting correctly, you will have destroyed your back and your muscles and, and, a, and your joints along with it. So yes, it's easy to get short-term results that seem like something to people. But the problem is if you have had no experience really training horses over years of time to see how they develop or even owned one long enough to have a clue of you know how they age, so to speak, you know, you need to know this information. So here the trot is still a little bit slow. I'd like to see it pushed on just a little bit. So you, I would just add a little bit of activity, but she's starting to stretch in there. So that's basically what you want to see you're filming at the same time that you're doing this. So kudos to you for both. But, you know, it's a hard thing to do. But you'd want to ask for just a little more swing, and I think she would give it to you. Watch as she goes down, how much better it gets. You can see now how the hind end is just kind of collapsing with each step. It's not pushing off the ground. See how the hock stays perfectly straight and the leg just kind of swings back. But watch as she does go down for those few moments, just like in the walk, all of a sudden it gets a little rounder for a moment. But you can see how here, if you watch her front leg, she's really stabbing her toes and pulling with her shoulders is really what she's doing. Most of her propulsion is coming from the shoulders. Again, that's why you see the underside of the neck so under, overdeveloped like that. That's what does that. You don't have to uh, see a horse ridden to know exactly how it's been trained. Just look at its muscling. So as for instance, when you saw these early photographs of this horse, you could tell immediately that the horse had not been worked over its back or had not been worked over its back for a long, long time. Even though the horse is quite thin, you know, and kind of looks aerobically fit, that's the thing we always have to be sure that we're recognizing, you know, is the horse is getting aerobically fit or is it getting fit to its entire muscle structure and building more strength? Now, most of the time we want to be building strength with horses. Now, there are horses that we have to worry about uh, getting them a little more aerobically fit. Like if you have, you know, the very, very uh, dull kind of warm bloods that just have this feeling like they'd rather just not do anything. Now that's starting to look really good there. And if those horses, then we do want to add a little more. But with thoroughbred horses, they get fit so fast. Training on the racetrack is about 15 minutes when they train them. It's about all it takes. They simply trot around one way and breeze back the other way. And that's the exercise. And look how fit those horses are when they do that. So these horses are built to do this kind of, you know, to do that kind of endurance and speed work. Now look how much better this looks. Every time she gets down there, really nice right there. Even for a moment, you can see how, how much it frees her shoulders a little bit. Still needs to swing through more actively, but this is certainly a, an improvement of where we started. It won't take long if you just every day stop at the optimal spot in your training, wherever that may be. And that's another thing to, for everyone to think about all the time when we train horses. I mean, is, is we want to do the most efficient work we can. It should rarely take you more than 45 minutes to train a horse, unless you're just going out for a hack or something like that. But if you're on a serious training day, 30 minutes to 45 minutes is about it, and an, an hour at the outside. And if you're having to work horses over an hour, there's something seriously wrong with what you're doing. And once again, that's why we see so many horses being injected now. And uh, I was just told yesterday about a study they're doing that they think the increase in colics at the moment have a lot to do with uh, all the injections that these horses are getting, which doesn't surprise me in the least. But most of the injections, with the exception of those few horses, uh, for instance, we had one that had a bone spur in its neck, and yes, that helped it. But, you know, all these hawk injections and maintenance injections that people are doing to horses, you know, really is just the wrong thinking. If you train right, you would rarely need to add joint fluid. But that's why. Think about it. That's what it is. When you're injecting a joint, you're putting more joint fluid into it. 
So just work your horses less. As I said, you know, rather than spending $800 on a veterinary call, and your horse seems like it's it needs that, then just uh, it would be better off because you're going to have to do that anyway to just turn it out for a little while. If you have somewhere to do it, and it certainly looks like uh, in uh, I don't know where you are exactly at the moment, but you've got some nice green pastures out there. So that was getting to a really good place there in the stretch. I was happy with that. And you come back to the walk now. And I think you stopped at about the right place. I don't think it was going to get much better than that today. So coming back to the walk is just what you want to do. But we just need this walk to get more active. So I think you can get after her a little more than you're doing. And uh, now, now this was a horse that was extremely nervous, folks, and she had a lot of difficulty with it. It was, you know, really uh, sounded like a pretty wild animal. So she's done a wonderful job of reclaiming this horse and uh, getting her to relax and come this far. But I think she has a state where, where you can begin to ask for a little more. Now notice how nice and closed her mouth is on the bridle there. And you see nice foam at the lips there. That's just what we would want to see. A little more active walk is just about all that we would need to see here. And she'll start swinging into it quite nicely. But you've really done a good job of bringing the horse to this point. I would like to see you begin to hook the line on. I mean, if the horse is going this well, um, and that was the problem with this horse, is that it was more problematic to try to lunge her with the line on. But you do want to try to get that going when you can here. And she's this relaxed. I certainly would try to hook the line to her and see if you can't do it. And so you can begin to develop a little contact with her. That's why it's so important that the contact with the bit be correct. I mean, I see a lot of movement now today around the world of people riding bridleless and bitless bridles and bridles and no bridles and all of these kind of things. And with the idea, I think that they're doing something humane, they think, because they don't have a bit in the horse's mouth. But, you know, from the view, from my view, is that, you know, the bit in a correctly trained horse, which is never punishing the horse's mouth, uh, allows you a very quick and soft communication that I think it would be impossible uh, to have you know with just by riding off, riding off the horse's face this is what you do in a bitless bridle I mean they put pressure on the nose around the nose so you know it's not like uh, you know you, the horse is still responding to that even if you're responding to a rope around the neck we used to ride our horses like that all the time when I was a kid just put a rope around their neck and just pull back on the rope against their neck <laughs> duh, and it stops them you know, so we even used to ride them with just now with, with just mane pressure. Just we could get on our horses in the field and ride away and just steer them, you know, by holding onto the mane a little bit. But we weren't asking them to go around, you know, Grand Prix courses or things like that, you know. But it's possible. I think all that work is great for people who like liberty training is great for people who really want to devote their lives to that. And this is what they totally like. It's more of a circus kind of thing, I think. But but why not? It's fun. It doesn't hurt the horses if they do it correctly. But it's not something for people to get the idea that they can go home and do this. It's just like, you know, evil Knievel jumping the Grand Canyon. Just because he did it doesn't mean that, you know, the next guy ought to try it. Because, uh, you know, it takes years and years of skill to be able to do this, to do that kind of work. So the same thing is true with horses. Of course, the beauty of the actual classical system here that you all are learning, though, is the fact that you don't have to be have a million years of experience training horses once you get these principles if you will stick to them. Yeah, I went through a lot of phases in my own training, obviously, but I've been doing this for many, many years. But I went through all the phases that most of you would be trying to go through. You know, I, I learned how to ride correctly from my father, then I unlearned that by riding with top trainers around the country. And uh, But because I had learned correctly to in the beginning of what it felt like to have a horse that moved free underneath you, you know, I was never happy with the idea of riding around holding on the brakes as we see so many people doing these days or forcing the necks into funny frames and this sort of thing. I was always taught as a child that if the horse wasn't stretching down, 
Well, you know, for instance, when you're out for a walk or even in the ring sometimes, that the horse needed to be able to see. That's what my father always said. The horse has to be able to see what it's, what it's about to go over. It doesn't need its head up in the air when you go out hacking or uh, cross country. I mean, there's nothing more dangerous. How many horses I've seen that got out of control and threw their heads up in the air. I've seen them jump on top of cars with people. I've seen one go off a cliff with someone. You know, in every kind of accident you can imagine. Because once the horse gets the head up there, it can't see where it's going. So if there's a hole right in front of you, you're going to plunge into it. As the horse would itself if it were running with its head straight up in the air and not paying attention to where it was going. So this is starting to look really good here. Now I'm starting to really like this walk where you're getting it to here. Are you starting to swing nicely? That's the best we've seen so far. This is going to be a wonderful horse to watch. And I think it will develop absolutely wonderful. I love thoroughbreds and I love thoroughbred mares and I've had a great success with many of them that people thought were untrainable, for instance, like perhaps, you know, perhaps that you all have seen on our website. She literally was the wildest crazy horse that, that uh, literally have ever encountered when we started her. But now she's a school horse at Art to Ride and everybody loves her and uh, Barb Bolton now has her and is doing a wonderful job with her as some of you have seen. And she's now 19 coming 20 years old I think, something like that. We have to stop thinking about you know, a 10 year old being an old horse, for instance, with this horse is nine years old. So at nine years old, this should, horse should have another good 15 years left in it if it gets sound, if we get it over its back and preserve its soundness. It's kind of like a horse at this level right now is kind of like a person who hasn't worked out and they're middle aged and they've let themselves fall apart. If they don't do it then, they never will. That's kind of the thing. So if this horse continues to get older, you know, and then progressively, uh, its health declines and uh, as its body declines. Because remember, the correct work helps the horse digest its food. That's why it's so important that the horse work through its abdominal muscles, which is why it's so true for human as well, because those are the muscles that support our internal organs. And we've seen such a huge, there's such a huge difference in horses uh, colicking that are over their backs and those that are not. If you talk to any veterinarian who's in an area where there's numerous types of horses, they'll tell you that they see the most colics at saddlebred barns number one, or Tennessee walking horse barns, if you're in one of those areas where that kind of brutality goes on. Once again, nothing wrong with those horses. It's just what people do to them. And sadly, that's what we were seeing dressage turn into. It was interesting the other day to see the, uh, some of the pictures that someone put up of a championship show in Sweden to see how completely upside down all these horses are. And just They look like they're all being tortured. And yet, yet the FBI is standing there. There's stewards there somewhere going, this is all okay. And judges who are giving this, you know, 17, 80% and 90% some scores. But see what's happened in the sport. Now, this is really beautiful here. Is it's, they've just sort of become this thing of, you know, oh, it's a parade of wealth, so to speak. So you just go buy the expensive horse and everybody will go along with the idea that you're a champion. <laughs> if you spend enough money. Really good there. However, my point is, you know, people riding made horses, you know, these horses that they can't even ride, trying to force them into frames, they're never really experiencing what riding can be and what dressage should be all about. This is that, you know, uh, creating a dialogue at a higher level with the horse, a closer sense of communication. That's what I mean about how important about the bit, you know, the horse correcting, accepting correct contact with the bit. The bit is never hurting the horse in the horse's mouth. It's just indicating to the horse. It allows you to feel and it lets the horse communicate back to you as well once you develop a sensitive feel through your fingers. But, you know, it's kind of like learning to read Braille. You know, it's not, you know, most people when they first put their fingers on the Braille will go, this just feels like a bunch of bumps. So, you know, once again, you have to learn to discern, you know, uh, very small gradations of contact and, and meaning in what the horse means when it suddenly pulls on the bridle or this or that. So you had a couple of moments there that were really, really good. There it goes back into it again. Now that's fantastic once again. Watch every time as the horse's head goes down how the hocks get rounder. Watch how the underside of the neck just completely loosens up. And the horse begins to swing a little bit further from the shoulder. Clearly as the horse goes up right there, you can see how once again the hocks start ending up way behind the horse. And the horse starts stabbing the ground more with the front end. 
a perfect example of a horse when it's working over its back and when it's not. And it was pretty much getting there. I wouldn't say it was yet completely working over its back, but you're working in the right direction. Now what you're going to see is this gets a little deeper and a little more consistent and you get the horse to swing a little more actively, you'll see that shoulder will completely free up and you'll see a much more swing to the front leg instead of kind of that stabbing motion that you now see. So I think you've done a great job on getting this started here and bringing this horse as long as far as you can. I really look forward to seeing your progress with this horse and I'm sure everyone else will as well as it will be really interesting. This looks like a really nice horse. As I said, I grew up in Kentucky. I love thoroughbred horses. I started retraining them at a very young age when I was a kid because that's what we had. You know, we didn't have warm bloods. And uh, they're fabulous horses, and I've had a great deal of success with them throughout my life. And uh, it's, I was have always been saddened by the fact that people, you know, have just sort of, um, they've disappeared because the trainers don't know how to train them. But once you learn this method, you'll be able to train any hot horse, uh, like Arabs or whatever. It's too bad so many Arabs are never trained correctly. They like that kind of craziness, it would seem. When they, I've been to one of those, some of those sales, and that's pretty uh, an interesting thing. It's the crazier the horse acts, the higher they bid it on it. So, but that's not real horsemanship. So, great job here. This is Will Faber from Archeride. I look forward to your next submission. Really, really good, and you're perfectly on the right track.